This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the Word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. Welcome to another edition of King of Biblical Life TV. We're doing it a little bit different today. We're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so instead of having a room full, I've kind of spread out my family to where I have just a little bit of people to talk to. Uh, as I begin, if you're at home, one of the things I want you to do is to go get a uh, little thing of juice and, and some crackers because we're going to take communion or the Lord's Supper at the end of this as we proceed forward. If you have your Bibles today, I want to turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. This message is entitled, Passover in the Lamb of God. Genesis 3 is a story about how the Nehesh, the serpent, came into the garden. It was a seraph that tempted Adam and Eve. And when they yielded to that temptation, they were infused with the iniquity for sin took a hold of humanity. And, you know, God had already told Adam in this narrative, the day that you eat of this fruit, you're going to die. And it would have been real easy for God to have come down, wiped out the two members of the original human race, and started all over again. It would have been a solution to the problem because only they were affected. But God didn't do that. We find here in verse 13, or verse 15, he, he does something different. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he, shall, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. He said, listen, something unusual is going to happen that the woman's seed that she is going through, the woman's seed that she is going to bear, this was a supernatural event because it, it takes a male to create a baby. But right here at the very beginning, God said, listen, there's going to be a virgin birth, that I'm going to do something supernatural, and when this promised one comes on the scene, that he is going to bruise the head, the head. I love that because he, I think he was not just talking of the head of the Nakesh, but listen, I'm going to bruise the head of the one that orchestrated this whole thing. And if everything falls, and everything within the kingdom, in any kingdom, falls from the king on down. Jesus is the head of all things. He is over the kingdom of God. Lucifer is the head over the kingdom of darkness. And he said, listen, when the Messiah, when the God of the kingdom is produced in the earth, when he takes on human flesh, the work that he's going to do is he is going to bruise the head of this thing, and that guy's never going to be the same. How many know that whenever you can, you can have your heel bruised and you may live for a little bit, is a whole lot different than traumatic brain injury. It's a whole lot different than having your head bruised. I remember years ago we had a a cat in, in our house back when we were in Dixon, and it just, it just had a thing for the front door like nobody's business. And one day that front door got closed, and that cat's head was in it, and that cat's head got bruised. 
And Mary will tell you that cat was never the same again. It just, it just wasn't right, okay? And I, I just kind of wonder after the cross if Lucifer just wasn't right, if there's something diminished in him. God prophesied this at the very beginning. Right here, if you'll mark this in your Bible, this is where grace began to be extended to humanity. Grace is not a New Testament reality. It is a Word of God reality. In fact, the word grace or its derivatives are used ten times more in the Old Testament than they are in the New. It's all throughout. This whole thing began with grace. And just like the plan of salvation, the working of grace began to expand from that point forward. God in his plan, how was he going to bring about this promised one? You know, the enemy thought, well, this this is going to be this first generation. Cain raises up and kills Abel. I think we've got it done. No, that wasn't even it. He didn't understand the plan. This thing has been hidden from him from the beginning. But God found a man in Babylon that history tells us that his family were even, not not only were they residents of Babylon, but his family business was making idols. So if there was anyone who wanted to keep promoting the religions of Babylon, it would have been Abram. But when Almighty God came to him and said, listen, I'm the only one true God, And I want you to leave everything that you know. I want you to leave the family business. I want you to leave the security of the city. I want you to leave everything. And I'm going to take you someplace that that you haven't seen, that you don't even know that's there. And Abraham had the audacity to believe God. Isn't that kind of what salvation is like? We, We hear the gospel message. And we hear the word say that, you know, taste and see that the Lord is good Well, all I've ever known is the Pharaoh of this world. Everything just turns to a pile of dung if I'm not careful. There there is entropy in the world. Everything begins to fall apart. The life that I thought I was going to have, I can't have because everything in the world resists it. And there's things within me that's causing me to self-sabotage and all these different things. And now all of a sudden I hear the gospel message. God is calling me like Abram to leave that and to come into something that I can't even wrap my head around. The world doesn't understand Christians. They don't understand how we can be happy when nobody else is happy. This morning in the midst of a pandemic, I'm driving over here to the office and I'm singing praises. I woke up with praises going through my head this morning. Why can I do that in the middle of a pandemic? The God that I serve is in control. If he can handle Lucifer and bruise his head and work out this plan of salvation, and he has handled pandemic after pandemic after pandemic. He was able to handle them before the CDC. He was able to handle them before the world governments. We need to understand that this God, his very word that came out of his mouth, holds the entire universe together. He's bigger than COVID-19. He's bigger than that situation. And one of the things that the church is learning in this hour is we are not, the church is not a building. The church is a people that have been blood-bought, blood-washed, and they're walking with Jesus of Nazareth. We don't need a building. We are the building of Almighty God. I am a walking temple. I'm starting to get into the book as I've been working on it. I've been writing on that right now, that we're not only a priesthood, but we're a temple. And when we can gather in a building, it's a gathering of the tents of God. The Mishkan, like the Mishkan of Moses. Mm. We, need, we, we, we need to, guys, we're worried about if we can survive not meeting as a group, as a church for a month, The early church went 300 years before they had their first church building. I think they knew more about what the church is than we do today. It's not about organizations. It's about a living relationship with the Savior. And this is a great time to press into Him. It's a great time to binge watch good preaching and good teaching. Don't just live on COVID-19 briefings constantly. 
It'll, it'll fill your heart full of fear. We need to make sure we're keeping abreast of what's going on. We take the proper actions to keep people safe. You know, one of the reasons that this is empty today is because I could not bear the thought of gathering the saints and have one of them get sick because we, dis, because we gathered. I would rather them set home in the safety of their home, me do a video, release it to where they can watch it. Thank God we have the mediums that we do today where we ha- we can, we're still doing the podcast. It doesn't quite sound as good as the, when we do it up here at the studio because it's kind of a mobile unit and I'm still trying to figure it out, but it gets the word out. We're able to communicate. What a wonderful time we're in to to have these technologies that something like this cannot stop the spreading of the gospel. But getting back to Abram. Abram was tested of God. Now, he he went through a lot of little tests in his life. You know, one of the the big ones in my book is when he went to Egypt and out of fear, he said, she's my sister. No, she's your wife. But as you see him growing in God, he began to grow in stature. He began to grow in this relationship with God which is really the task of all of us. That's one of the reasons we do the feast, so that each year I can learn more about Jesus. If, you're, if Jesus is not in your feast, and the day and hour in which we're living, you're not doing the feast. Ever since Jesus gave his life on the cross, he showed us that they were shadows of him, and so now we celebrate them, they center around Jesus. That's why as I'm dealing with Passover, I'm centering around the Lamb of God. That, because you can't have a Passover without a lamb. Okay? And so now, Abram has matured and God is doing things in his life. <coughs> in fact, he's to the place that uh, he's no longer Abram, he's Abraham. Because his faith grew to the place that it produced the son of promise. We pick up here in Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. And now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will, uh, which I shall tell you. I would have had a long argument with God right there. But he grew enough in faith, God told him. He knows God has a plan. The book of Hebrews even says that he in a vision, although he had, although at that time in history, there had never been a resurrection from the dead. The book of Hebrews tells us that he believed in his heart that God was going to raise him up out of the ashes. That he already had in his heart, I'm going to sac- God call for a burnt sacrifice. I'm going to offer my son. I'm going to light the fire. And I'm going to watch that child come back up out of the ashes and come back into my arms. Whew. What a man of faith. How many know that over a thousand years later, almost two thousand years later, the tomb was opened. And the son come out of the tomb back into the arms of his father. God is exact in everything that he does. We go a little bit further in the story in verse 7 and 8. And Isaac spake to Abraham his father and said, My son, and he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, all of a sudden, Abraham went to prophesying. This is a prophetic word because Abraham already knew that God told him, I want you to sacrifice your son. But listen to the words here. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And the two went together. That is a prophetic word. This is one of the reasons that the rabbis will consider both Moses and Abraham prophets. Abraham was a prophet. God talked to him. He prophesied. Moses is considered not only a prophet but an apostle because he was one sent by God to deliver. And so when the apostle Paul talks about we're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, he wasn't talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all the rest of them. He was talking about Moses and Abraham and David and all the ones that walked with God. Now, let's go on down a little bit further, starting in verse 9. 
And it came to pass, or it, and they came to the place where God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here am I. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Now this is not a fulfillment of the prophetic word he gave. He said God would provide a lamb. This was a ram. But we need to understand that all of us, we come into a testing from God. All of us are tested by God. This right now in the earth could be a testing. I do not believe that God created the COVID-19 virus. <clears throat> but in the midst of it, it's a testing to see how we respond. Are we going to react in fear? Are we going to react in faith? Are we going to put other people first? What are we going to do? How does our faith play out in the midst of all this? This was a testing of Abram, but Abraham was a man in blood covenant with God. Because in the, the whole concept of blood covenant is I can never ask of my blood covenant partner something which I am not willing to do myself. He asked Abraham to give his son a promise on the altar for him. This act, this passing of this test, opened the door for God to, and, and by a virgin named Mary, for her to bring forth a son. And Almighty God made him an earth suit in the body of Mary. And Jesus was Almighty God in the flesh because Almighty God became the Lamb. If Abraham had not passed this test, the cross would have to have come through another way and another people. You say, well, Mike, what does that have to do with anything with me going on right now? Well, number one, if you're not saved, you need to understand God has had a plan from the beginning. God did not create sin. God did not cause man to fall. It was a decision of man. And all the evil in the world is a, is a product of the response that Adam and Eve had done in the garden. It is not the fault of God. But God said, listen, I'm going to make a way. I'm going to extend grace. And because that grace extended, that grace got a hold of a man named Abraham, Abram, and transformed him into Abraham that was willing to pass the test and be obedient to God. And right now, we may be going through a test. The test that we're doing right now, how we respond right now, may not only affect tomorrow, next year, and the rest of our lives, it may even affect our children and our grandchildren. When we get into a challenging situation, it becomes a test that either we can get demoted or we can get promoted. Abraham, in this one, reacted not only a way of promotion, but how many know that it promoted the very plan of salvation for humanity? In verse 11, it says, And Abraham called the place, The Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh. And I remember years ago when the charismatic movement, we used to dance around Jehovah Jireh, my provider is grace is sufficient for me. But in our hearts we're saying, he's going to get me stuff. He's going to get me stuff. I'm going to get a lot of stuff. That is not what this is talking about. He named the place Jehovah Jireh because God was going to provide the lamb. God was going to provide the sacrifice. In fact, you know, one of the things that I have studied before this event, I don't really see a ram's horn really even being mentioned in Scripture as a way of, you know, sounding for alerts or whatever. It was after that, and it became very, it really began to explode after they, they were delivered from Egypt. And I've wondered if this wasn't the turning point that, because you can, you can blow the ram's horn in such a way that it's a cry. Before the cross, it was a cry for the Lamb of God to come. After the cross, it's a declaration of what the Lamb of God has done. Amen. 
Because Abraham passed this test. Now listen to this in verse 15. Then angel Lord called Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you. Multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which are on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemy. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. You see, I'm a seed. I'm a piece of sand. I'm, a, I'm one of those stars. Because ancient Abraham believed God and had the audacity of faith to be willing to do this. That's one of the reasons the Apostle Paul says we are now of the seed of Abraham. We are fulfilling prophecy when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and we're grafted into the same tree that Abraham is grafted into. We are fulfilling the prophetic word that God swore. Now that, that's, that's a technical term, you're in blood covenant. In fact, the word goes on to say that God swore by none greater than himself, but he swore by himself. What that means is, if I don't fulfill this, I'll destroy myself. And I can say, you know what? Daddy, you don't have to because I came in. I came in because of what the Lamb of God did. And here I am in my pulpit without tissues again. I'm going to have to rectify that one of these days. I get so busy wanting to preach, I forget about sometimes what I need. Now we go to Exodus chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. God's people have been in slavery for 400 years. In bondage of Egypt. The Pharaoh of Egypt is a type and shadow of the God of this world, the Pharaoh of this world. And what's interesting is that the Pharaoh line may have started with Nephilim. So you have that contaminated line, and almost every major leader group, to include presidents of the United States, the royal houses of Europe, many of them all lead back to the house of Pharaoh. No wonder they're wanting a one world order. They're of the other clan. And God began to pour out judgment. He began to systematically judge the gods of Egypt. We pick it up here in verse 13. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generation. And you shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. I believe in the new heaven and new earth. The Bible talks about us meeting from one Sabbath to the next. <coughs> but I believe that we're going to still remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. We're going to remember the ultimate Passover. Blood over the doorpost will free you from the slavery of Egypt of this world. In fact, the book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says in According to the law, all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Some translations translate it, no remission of sin. Years later, we find in the New Testament, according to Jesus, is one of the greatest prophets that ever walked the land. And he's baptizing, he's mikvahing the people, the baptism of repentance, which is a reflection of before God had his people meet him at Mount Sinai, they spent three days in ceremonial washing to even wash the dust and the stench of Egypt off of them before they met with God. And historically, whenever there would be baptismal pools all around Jerusalem, that whenever they would go and they would go before they would go into the temple, there would be a mikvah, this cleansing. And John the Baptist was supposed to prepare the way of the Lord. So he's calling people to repentance, and there's a ceremonial washing, a baptism. Baptism did not start with the apostle or with John the Baptist, it started with Moses. 
And he's having them do that because he's preparing the people, the hearts of the people, for the coming of Messiah. He was the forerunner. But then one day it says here in verse 9 of John chapter 1, And the next day, next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now what's interesting in that time, they understood exactly what that was, that this was the lamb that was prophesied by Abraham. But you know what? They weren't looking for a lamb. They wanted a king. It went against what they were wanting and what they were looking for. But God has his agenda and humanity has its own. Even religious people will have their own agenda. Sometimes that can go against the plan of God. But how many know the plan of God is unaltered by our religiosity? God is going to do what he's going to do according to his counsel and not the counsel of men. That when Jesus came, he came as the Lamb of God. He was the Lamb that was promised to Abraham when Abraham said, God will provide for himself a Lamb. And guys... Where he stood, they built Jerusalem. The exact same spot, the spot that Abraham declared, this is Jehovah Jireh, this is the place where God provides. It was there that there was a cross hung, and God provided a lamb for our salvation. Even the high priest during Passover, it is the responsibility of the high priest to go down to Bethlehem and to choose the lamb that he would give for the whole nation, that he would sacrifice for the whole nation. And we find here in John chapter 11, verses 47 through 52, now Jesus, where was he born? Bethlehem. This is the declaration of the high priest, and only the high priest had, this, had the right to declare this. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And the one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did uh, not saying on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for, not for that nation only, but also he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. You know, there's, there's, people have used the Passion Week of Christ to come against the Jewish people. They had their important role to play. And if the high priest had not done this, if they had not crucified Christ, there would have never have been salvation. God declared this from the very beginning. It had to be the high priest that declared it. It had to be the Jewish people that promoted it. And let me tell you something, our hands are not clean either because it was the Roman soldiers, it was the Gentiles who did it. All humanity worked in concert to sacrifice the lamb. But see, it wasn't just enough to sacrifice the lamb. He had to be examined. Whenever you brought the lamb into your house, Passover lamb, you examined him, you looked him over just as good as you can to make sure that that lamb was a blemish in any way. Do you know Jesus was examined during the Passion Week? We find here in John chapter 18 and 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, uh, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault at, in him at all. Examination. We then go on down to John chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. So then, uh, so then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a, a purple robe, and they said, Hail, J Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Then Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I bring him out to you, that you may know I find no fault in him." 
the Roman official said twice, I find no fault in him. But we pick up in John chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, and that Jesus came out and wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, Behold the man! Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to him, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Now, Hebraically, whenever you have something repeated three times, it brings it to its superlative. There's only two things in all the Word of God that's brought to the superlative. That God is holy, holy, holy. And then the testimony of Pilate, there's no fault in him, there's no fault in him, there's no fault in him. Innocent lamb, innocent lamb, innocent lamb. Now let's go on down to verse 14 of John chapter 19. The Lamb of God offered up. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour he said to the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to him, Shall I crucify your king? Underline that in your Bible. Him as an official representative of Rome just recognized Jesus as the King Messiah and declared it to the people. The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered them to them to be crucified, so they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to the place called the Place of the Skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. Now, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the, writing, and, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The many of the Jews who read this title, for it was placed where Jesus was crucified, was near, uh, was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but he said, I am the King of the Jews. And Pilate said, I have written what I have written. Now you have to think Hebraically they were constantly looking for signs. And one of the ways in writing that they would look for signs or acrostics. Now Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, if I'm remembering right because I didn't write it down here, is Yeshua, uh, Yeshua, uh, HaNazareth, Vamalek, HaYehuda. When you look that down and it's an acronym, it literally spells yod Hey vav Hey. When they saw that, they saw the representative of Rome just said this was Yahweh hanging on the cross. We want you to change it, to change the acronym, to change the, that the sacred name is not there. And Pilate said, I've written what I've written. It was Yahweh, the grace of God. Yahweh represents the grace and mercy of God. Elohim represents the justice of God, the grace of God. God, the grace personified in the person of Jesus was hanging on the cross. Jesus became our sacrifice in the exact same place that Abraham was willing to offer up his son for us. But there's more to the story. I want to go to Isaiah chapter 53. The prophets of old declared what was going to happen. In fact, this, these verses are forbidden by the rabbis for any Jewish person to read and to study. You know why? You can't read it and not see Jesus. We need to understand that all the, the betrayal in the garden how he was despised and rejected, all of that was him bearing our rejection, our betrayals, our sin, everything that came upon humanity because of what Adam and Eve had done in the garden when they, when they accepted the sin nature. All the consequences 
both past and present, the cross is the ultimate singularity in space-time. Because the blood of eternity ran down that cross, that it, it in, in a sense, it, 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 this, this first heaven couldn't handle it. It filled all three heavens, if you will. It filled all time. Everything before that flowed to the cross. Everything in front of that flowed backward to the cross. The blood is still just as powerful today to save someone, to cleanse them from sin, to restore their lives as it was the day that it flowed out of his body. Listen to the words of Isaiah. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we did as it were, uh, we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrow. Surely. That's so important. It's not just maybe. It's surely he has done this. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But listen, he was wounded for our transgressions. What happens when you're wounded? You bleed. There is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. The nails upon his hands and his feet and the blood that was shed was so that our sins could be forgiven. Why did he have the crown of thorns and the agony that went with that? How many of us have had mental anguish and the blood flowed there too? so that we could be restored. It said he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. Why bruised? The very concept of iniquity is to be bent toward sin. So if something is grabbed and twisted back correctly, you could end up bruising it. So it's not just the blood of Jesus, it's the bruises of Jesus. When we start dealing with people dealing with uh, multi-generational curses in the form of bad behavior. Sin, the, the, each, each family there'll be a line where some will have, uh, ang you know, they'll have extreme anger or extreme greed or, or can't handle money or, or sexual promiscuity. You'll, you'll see these trends Jesus was bruised so they can be straight. Now, every crooked way will be made straight. In us first, then in the world. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. Believer, in the midst of this, do you have peace? He was chastised so that you could. Are we looking too much at the situation and not enough on the Savior? Come on. And by his stripes, we are healed. We are healed. That's why there's still healing through the power of Jesus. Men do not have the power to heal. We have the, we have the privilege of praying. Only God heals. And we need the healing touch of God in this hour like never before. But we need to trust it. And I remember there was a story I heard on James Robinson years ago, and it just kind of shows you the, the humor of God. There was a minister that had a disease that took a hold of his vocal cords. He could no longer pastor. But people so loved to hear him teach that they said, teach Sunday school. They even made a, a, a mic that would come around and almost go into his mouth. And he could just barely get a whisper, but they could turn it up enough where they could hear it. And he's teaching on these verses, and he goes back to the basic Baptist doctrine of God no longer heals today. And as those words came out of his mouth, God healed his voice. Oh. Guys, even in situations where we have given up, God hasn't. The cross is the answer for everything. But I mean, no, Jesus didn't stay dead. Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, 
after the first day of the week began to dawn. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his, clo and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just like he said. Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. You know, one of the most vicious enemies that we have left is death. Our Savior conquered it. He conquered it. The Apostle Paul, looking at the resurrection of Jesus and the promise of our resurrecting from the dead, he said, Grave, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? This is distemporary. To be absent from this body is to be with the Lord. But how many know there's a day coming, and I believe it's closer than it has ever been, that there is going to be the sound of a shofar like you have never heard before, and the dead in Christ are going to rise. Oh, say, Mike, how was that possible? There's not enough dirt on the planet. You know, I've heard people try to give that argument, you know, and how could God sort it all? Well, our DNA stored in heaven even counts the number of the hairs on your head. All God, in your DNA is everything that God needs to do to create a supernatural creative miracle of a new body. It's going to happen. I can't wait for it. That body is going to be thin and muscular. It's never going to have to worry about COVID-19 or COVID-94. It's not going to have to worry about any sickness or disease. It will be impervious to aging, to death. There will be no sin. I won't have that sin nature anymore. And I'll be able to see my Savior and look in His face and worship Him. In Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, the apostles said something very important. Because we live in a day that people are saying, listen, there's so many ways to heaven. There's so many ways. Let me tell you something. What did Buddha do for me? Absolutely nothing. What did all the other philosophers or those that they claimed to be prophets from different religions, what did Zoeaster do for me? Nothing. It was Jesus that came and paid a price for a debt he didn't know. Acts chapter 4 verse 10, the, the apostles are declaring, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by the builders, which is now become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's no other way but Jesus. There's no other way but the price that he paid on the cross. God provided the Lamb. Jesus came the first time as Messiah ben Joseph, the suffering servant. He said, he said, listen, I'm not coming this time to judge the world. I'm coming to save the world. But the next time that he comes, that I'm waiting for, and I believe I'm going to see in my lifetime, and maybe quicker than I think, that when he comes, it's not to save the world. He's already done it. It's going to be to judge the world and what they did with his gift. So before I go on to the next step, if you're listening today and you have not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you need to understand that without Jesus, you are without hope. You may have the best this world has to offer. You may be one of the world's elite, or you may be living in absolute poverty. You're both going to end up in the same place, a burning hell. And it won't be God's choice. God did everything he could do to set you free. He came and he paid the price for you. And all you have to do is receive it and believe that Jesus was Almighty God come in the flesh. Say, Lord, I believe that you're Almighty God come in the flesh and that you bore my sins on the cross. 
And I declare that you are God, that you rose from the dead. I believe in you, and I'm going to follow you. Come, fill my life. Take over. I renounce Satan. I renounce everything of this world. And I grab onto you and you alone, because now you are my Lord. If you'll do that, your life is going to change radically. You're going to be like Abram. You're walking out of Babylon, heading for the promised land. Now, if you have accepted Jesus, Passover historically is when the early church took the Lord's Supper. It took several hundred years and a lot of theological argument for it to be moved to the Sunday that, we, that, that they end up calling Easter. It's Passover. That's confirmed by Polycarp. It's confirmed by many of the other anti nicene fathers. The closer you get to Jesus, the more they were doing it. The further you get away, all of a sudden all this other stuff began to creep in. Interesting thing about Passover. The rabbis didn't go in the homes I do Passover services. The head of each household. You know, we, we, we look at modern day church and we still draw too much from Catholicism. I remember being raised and, and I surrendered to ministry at 13. And I remember my grandpa was at that time one of the oldest living ministers in that denomination. And he was instructing me, he said, now only a minister can administer the Lord's table. Well, we got that from Rome. We just, we just separated the transubstantiation that we were literally crucifying Christ afresh. We separated that, but we said, you know, you have to be an ordained minister to do that. That is not found anywhere in the Word of God. Nowhere. In fact, when on the Ev Shabbat meal, when you bless the bread and the wine, you can turn that into the Lord's table. The Apostle Paul dealing with specifically Passover. And that you had some Gentiles getting in. They said, hey man, there's wine. And, and Jewish wine is very sweet. And it will also get you really, really drunk. And they were going too far. They, were th they would end up having a drunken party because that's kind of what they had down at the Temple of Diana and the Temple of Baal or whatever was going on with the, the gods of that city. And they hadn't been sanctified enough. So Paul has to bring correction for how they celebrated Passover. Now, one of the things that I, I'm of the conviction, now you can, you can you know, do a, a basic Passover Seder and say, okay, we remember the lamb, we remember the bitter herbs and all this and how it all points to Jesus. And if you're not doing that, you're not doing it right. But I believe that Messiah interpreted that. He reduced that to bread and wine. That's also confirmed in the writings of Polycarp. They said, listen, this is how John taught me to do it. You take the bread and you take the wine. That's also what the Apostle Paul did here. And so if you're at home, you can do this with your family any time that you want to. You don't have to wait once a year. But you can open this up. They say, what if I'm don't have a husband, I'm not married, you can do it yourself. Because in a great sense, if you're not married, you're still head of your household. You're the one who, who supplies that household. But if you are married, the husband should do it. And I want to I do it with you guys today. The Apostle Paul did it very simply. He gave them instruction. This is how you take the Lord's Supper. We find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 23 through 26. And he even says, listen, I received this of the Lord, or from the Lord. And there was a time the Apostle Paul was taken up to the third heaven where he communed with Jesus. And Jesus showed him what we call the Pauline Revelation. And in the midst of that, Jesus showed him how to get this thing done. And so he gives us the instruction. He says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said. And so I'm going to pray, and it just can be a simple prayer, because you see the power is not in the elements. And if, if you can't find matzo bread, a saltine cracker will work, because it's, there's, there's nothing magical in the elements. 
It's the biblical concept of remembering that I remember that his body was broken for me, that I remember the stripes that was on his back. And in the remembering, it does something in me. That's what makes it so important. And Father, I thank you that you came in the person of Jesus and that you gave your life on the cross for us, Yahweh. That you were wounded for our transgressions, you were bruised for our iniquity, and by your stripes were healed. I remember it as I see this bread that your body was broken so that my body could be restored. Father, I thank you and I praise you for it in Jesus' name. And it says, and he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, Lord, we thank you for the blood. We thank you because of what you did on the cross in this person and on my, in my household. The blood is over the doorpost. I thank you that I am blood-bought. I am blood washed. I am delivered by the blood. I have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son. And I declare that your blood is enough. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Paul also goes on to say, for now, as often, for as often, how often is often? Anytime you want. Any time that you need to remember, any time that you need to stir your faith. For often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The New Testament message was to proclaim the death of the Lord and his resurrection. That's the mainstay of the gospel. It's about time we start doing it again. Well, Father, I thank you for... All my own church family that can't be with us today, they're watching this by video. All those that are our partners and friends around the world. Lord, I pray for them, Father. Give them peace, Father. Let your presence fill their homes. Let your provision take care of them. Let your peace be upon them. Lord, let us be given the grace to respond by faith and not fear. Not only in this situation... But as the end times unfold before us, we're going to see challenge after challenge that's going to require us to not walk in fear, but walk in faith. And let us remember, in the midst of all that, who Jesus really is. And that he rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. The fallen immortals that rule the kingdom of darkness have enabled the esoteric societies that control this world to nearly fulfill Nimrod's dark directive. They have taken society down the Luciferian rabbit hole into a technological matrix of darkness. But the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his demonic forces for the final showdown without raising up one of his own. God is waking up people around the world who are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber and are answering heaven's call. There is an end-time empowerment coming for God's remnant, and it is beginning to unfold in our day. It is time to awaken, be empowered, and become the Sheerith in this generation. The Sheerith Imperative is a must-have tactical manual for God's remnant in the last days. Get your copy at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Hell may have its directive, but heaven has its imperative. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. 
Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store dot biblical dash life dot com that store dot biblical dash life dot com